The first section of the book is quite dense and we will go through some of the important passages in order to interpret them. The text begins, When Zarathustra was thirty years old, he left his home and the lake of his home and went into the mountains. Here he enjoyed his spirit and his solitude, and for ten years he did not tire of it. But at last his heart transformed. One morning he arose with the dawn, stepped before the sun, and spoke thus to it. You great star, what would your happiness be if you had not those for whom you shine? Let's go to the very beginning of the text. I believe the number 30 is quite important here, because this number for Nietzsche represents immaturity. How do I know this? Because there is another section in this book titled On Free Death. Now, I don't want to jump to that section at this very moment, but there is something important that I need to point out. In that section, Nietzsche says that Christ died quite young. And the sources tell us that when Christ was crucified, he was in his thirties. In the section on free death, Nietzsche says that had Christ lived long enough, he would have realized his mistakes. He was great enough uh, to realize that. So this is quite important. In contrast to Christ, Zarathustra does not think that he is mature when he steps into his thirties. It takes him ten years to mature, or you could say it takes him ten years for him to think that he has become matured. The crucial point is that from the very beginning Nietzsche is going against Christianity and against the figure of Christ. There is something else that is important in the first line, and it's the word home. Nietzsche did all he could to criticize his own society. So when you are born in a specific society, you are not able to see the flaws of that society. You need to put yourself at a distance. From a distance, things begin to look ridiculous. When you are not attached to a place, when you put a distance between you and that place, you begin to ridicule it. You begin to make fun of it. There is a reason why Zarathustra leaves his home. To gain perspective. He does it to gain perspective. And another thing, when you are at home, when you are in your society, you are not alone. But Zarathustra went into the mountains precisely because he wanted to be alone. Solitude is quite important in existentialism. Both Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, they were baffled by society's attitude toward solitude. What they didn't understand was why society looked down upon solitude. Normally, when you want to punish someone, you put them in a corner or you lock them up or whatever. The point is that you want them to be alone with their thoughts. Solitude is how you punish people. But for Kierkegaard or for Nietzsche, solitude is something that you should freely choose to enter. Zarathustra spends 10 years in the mountains. And then after 10 years, his heart becomes transformed. This again is another important concept, transformation. Transformation always comes at a price. And in this case, it was the 10 years that Zarathustra paid with his life. But when he becomes transformed, the first thing that he does is that he speaks to the sun. Why is this important? because it is related to what Zarathustra is going to do. Zarathustra sees the sun as something overflowing. It has too much to give. After his transformation, Zarathustra is in the same position. He thinks that he has gained too much knowledge and he wants to bestow this knowledge to everyone else. 
But there is a problem here. In his solitude, there is no one else that Zarathustra can talk to. He says, For ten years you have come up here to my cave. You would have tired of your light and of this route without me, my eagle, and my snake. This is an interesting passage. If you've read Don Quixote, there is a certain similarity between these two, uh, between this passage and what Don Quixote goes through. Many believe that it was Sancho who prolonged Don Quixote's madness. Without Sancho, Don Quixote wouldn't have anyone to talk to, and he might have tired of what he was doing. The son is the same as Don Quixote. He needs a Sancho. Zarathustra, his eagle, and his snake are like Sancho to the son. And now it is Zarathustra who wants to become a Don Quixote. He wants to look for his own Sancho. Now, I don't want you to think that um, Zarathustra is mad because I just compared him with Don Quixote. What I want you to take from this is that I want you to realize how Zarathustra gained a perspective, gained some knowledge which he thinks uh, is true. Now he wants to actualize his knowledge. He wants to share it. He wants to share it with other people. In that sense, anyone who becomes a Zarathustra is a Don Quixote. There are only perspectives. What Zarathustra gains is one perspective amongst others. Let's move on. Zarathustra continues. He says, But we awaited you every morning, took your overflow from you, and blessed you for it. I want you to pay attention to the prefix over. So Nietzsche believes that it is this abundance that enables you to become Zarathustra. Without this abundance, there cannot be any going under, as Nietzsche puts it. Incidentally, this prefix in German is, is über, as in übermensch, or überfluss. Now, because of this abundance, Zarathustra thinks that he has too much knowledge. He says, Behold, I am weary of my wisdom. You should not take this lightly, because, because we see here that with wisdom comes responsibility. Zarathustra doesn't need to communicate his knowledge to other people, but he feels an urge inside, uh, inside, uh, inside him. This urge is his sense of responsibility. He thinks that for this I must descend into the depths. This is particularly strange because later on Nietzsche will talk about exaltation. These are two opposite extremes, but they are not unconnected. Later on when I make my series on The Fall, on the book The Fall by Albert Camus, we will see why this is so important. Because only when you are exalted, you can choose to go down. You will have freedom to choose. It can be anything you want. I mean, you are from the you you are standing on the pinnacle. You can do whatever you want. You can choose to stay there or you can choose to go down. People who are not exalted, they do not have this choice. So here Zarathustra is speaking from the position of strength. It is he himself who chooses to go down or to go under. He has options. So he chooses to go down. He talks to the son and says, like you, I must go down. In German, this verb is untergehen, which means to go under like the sun, just as you would say the sun goes down. The verb is important because we will hear the verb übergehen, which means to go over. And by going over, you make a bridge between yourself and the Übermensch. When Nietzsche uses the verb untergehen, it also means going over rather than just going down. And the only reason why Zarathustra is able to achieve this going over is that he is at the top. He chooses to go down. And the last sentence of the section is 
Thus began Zarathustra's going under. Again, untergehen, but it also implies übergehen. Section 2 of the Prologue What happens when Zarathustra climbs down? He encounters an old man. Now my relation to the old man is ambivalent. The old man is not an idiot, but he has two major problems. First of all, he has an attachment to the otherworldly, and secondly, he is a pessimist. That's a definite no-no for Nietzsche. He despised pessimism, and more than anything else, he despised the otherworldly. There are certain similarities between the old man and Zarathustra. First of all, both of them are hermits, but the old man doesn't understand the responsibility of, of knowledge. He might have gained some wisdom in his solitude, but he is not willing to share it. He warns Zarathustra against other people. He says, are you not worried that they might punish you? This is because he doesn't understand the responsibility of knowledge or wisdom. For an existentialist, knowledge implies responsibility. Take the case of Galileo. Galileo was not an existentialist. Why? Because he realized that when the church was onto him, he could lose his life. So he, he basically took back what he said. Now compare this attitude with Zarathustra. Zarathustra doesn't sound worried. He is willing to accept the consequences. The old man says, This wanderer is no stranger to me. Many years ago he passed by here. Zarathustra he was called, but he is transformed. Again we see the word transformed. Transformed to what? Transformed from something unripe to ripe from immaturity to maturity. The old man goes on. Zarathustra is transformed. Zarathustra has become a child. Okay, wait a minute. A child. This sounds offensive, but it really is not. It's actually a compliment for Nietzsche. Normally, in our society, when you want to condemn someone, you say that you are acting childish. But that would be high praise for Nietzsche. Zarathustra has become childish. Why is this a positive thing? There is a famous phrase by Heraclitus which says, the kingdom belongs to a child. For Nietzsche, this is an important um, phrase. The child represents irrationality. And if you've seen my video about existentialism, in that video I pointed out why irrationality is important for existentialism. The child represents irrationality. What does a child do when he plays? When a child plays, he destroys. He, uh, he's not a rational being. He doesn't care what he's doing. He just cares about destruction. But most importantly, he creates out of destruction. Later, we will see this concept again and again. Destruction and creation. So that's what becoming a child means. To become destructive, but also to become creative. Now let's move on a bit and see what the old man says. As I said before, he warns Zarathustra against society, against other people. He tells him that they might punish him. The old man says they are mistrustful of hermits. Again, we see the concept of solitude here. And as I said in the previous section, society always looks down upon solitude. Here we see the old man who has gained the knowledge that Society is mistrustful of hermits. Why? Because as I said, you would force someone to become lonely to go into solitude who has done some wrong. So of course, when you encounter a hermit, your first reaction would be, what has he done wrong? Why is he alone? You won't be able to trust that person. 
The old man is a pessimist. He realizes that and he tells Zarathustra, do not go to mankind and stay in the woods. This advice comes from pessimism. It is said out of his despise for mankind or out of his mistrust. This advice is not a true appreciation of solitude. Let's see what Zarathustra has to say. He asks, what does the saints do in the woods? The saints answered, I make songs and sing them. There is a reference to Lutheranism here, because as you know, Luther praised music. He loved music. The old man says, I make songs, thus I praise God. This is exactly what Luther believed. He believed that by making music, you are praising God. Again, we see why the figure of the old man is problematic here. Nietzsche loved music. He was a composer. He wasn't just a philosopher. Here, the problem is that the old man represents someone like Wagner. The problem with Wagner is that, for Nietzsche, Wagner turned out to be too religious, too attached to the otherworldly. If you want an example of this, you should watch the opera Parsifal. And at the end, Zarathustra expresses his disappointment with the old man. He says, This old saint in his woods has not yet heard the news that God is dead. We see the contrast here. Zarathustra and the old man both became hermits. But at the end of the journey, each came out differently. Each gained a different perspective. Once again, we have another dense section in front of us. Let's read the text. When Zarathustra came into the nearest town, lying on the edge of the forest, he found many people gathered in the marketplace for it had been promised that a tightrope walker would perform. We see here that during his first encounter with people, the first thing Zarathustra notices about people is that they are flocked together. I've been emphasizing how important the single individual is in existentialism. So it's not a coincidence that when Zarathustra first encounters people, he sees them flocked together. Without beating around the bush, he tells them, I teach you the overman. The overman, the superman, or the ubermensch, whichever you prefer, has proved to be a problematic concept in philosophy as well as in politics. Scholars don't really agree on what Nietzsche intended to convey by the overman. Is Nietzsche talking about a single individual? Is he talking about a superior race? Does he think the Ubermensch is an achievable goal? Or is it just a thought experiment which is intended to provoke us? Is it a Darwinian idea? There are no straight answers to these questions. What can be even more mysterious is that there is almost no mention of the Ubermensch after the prologue. What does this mean? Does Zarathustra give up on the idea or what? Again, scholars don't agree. In any case, we don't need to concern ourselves with these questions for now. Because here in section 3, Zarathustra actually gives us some clues as to what he means by the Ubermensch. So let's just read the text and see what Zarathustra has to tell us. We are told, all creatures so far created something beyond themselves, and you want to be the above this great flood and would rather go back to animals than overcome humans? In the previous section, we talked about the concept of creation. Here we encounter that concept again. Creating something beyond oneself. How are we to interpret that? Not only is Zarathustra talking about something of a higher value, something that exceeds you, but he is also using the word beyond in a chronological sense. 
meaning leaving something valuable behind after you're gone, leaving something for posterity. How do we know this? For now, you should take my word for it. But later, when Zarathustra talks about the last human being, we'll see one of the flaws of the last human being is that he only thinks of himself and doesn't do anything for posterity. The last human being is the opposite of the Ubermensch. So the idea is that you should create something beyond yourself for future generations. Zarathustra is concerned about the next generation. He is worried about progress and what we are leaving behind. When he asks, would you rather go back to animals than overcome humans, he is expressing his concern about moving forward. Moving forward as an individual and as society. This will be important in a bit. As we move on, we see a more Darwinian take on the Overman. We read, What is the ape to a human, a laughing stock or a painful embarrassment? And that is precisely what the human shall be to the Overman, a laughing stock or a painful embarrassment. There is a Darwinian undertone here, but it's not clear if Nietzsche is talking literally about this or he is using this metaphorically. What sort of an analogy is this? I leave that to you to decide. Moving on. Zarathustra says, Behold, I teach you the overman. We hear this phrase a few times in this section. I think he says it about four times if I'm not mistaken. It's actually the very first thing he says to people. It establishes Zarathustra as a teacher. It tells us that Zarathustra is exalted enough to have the right to talk about the Ubermensch. He continues, The Overman is the meaning of the earth. I believe this to be the most important sentence in the whole section. Forget about everything else. This is what you should pay attention to. If you take anything away from this section, I want it to be this. Zarathustra says, I beseech you, my brothers, remain faithful to the earth and do not believe those who speak to you of extraterrestrial hopes. Zarathustra is advocating materialism. He is warning people against anything supernatural. He is warning people against anything otherworldly. The German word for extraterrestrial is überirdisch, which means extraterrestrial, but it can also mean something otherworldly, something supernatural that doesn't belong to this world. Extraterrestrial is a more radical translation. It puts an emphasis on here and now. The word otherworldly is more general. Of course, it's hard to talk about the otherworldly without talking about God and religion. So let's talk about the unavoidable topic. Once the sacrilege against God was the greatest sacrilege, but God died, and then all these desecrators died. In section 2 of the prologue, we heard the phrase, God is dead. But this time, in the third section, we hear it in the past tense. This is crucial because here Zarathustra is emphasizing the distance between the fact and himself. This makes the claim more objective. The past tense can be interpreted in another way. Before writing Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche had announced the death of God in the gay science. In that book, Nietzsche tells of a madman who just like Zarathustra goes to the marketplace. There is a contrast between the madman and Zarathustra. The madman is overly concerned about God's death. But Zarathustra, by using the past tense, announces the death of God as a mere historical fact, as something that is over and done with. We should move on from it. The question which troubles him is, why is it that, despite God's death, people are still clinging on to Christian values? 
People might have forgotten about God, but Christian values are still present in daily life. When Zarathustra says, human being is something that must be overcome and asks, what have you done to overcome him? One of the things he has on his mind is that he wants to know what people have done to overcome Christian values. God died a long time ago, but what have we done since his death? Have we managed to revaluate all values? Apparently, despite God's death, people have not learned to remain faithful to the earth yet, precisely because they have retained the old values. Even worse, they do not regard these values as problematic because they have secularized them. Secularization gives us a false sense of reassurance. We falsely assume we have removed the dangerous aspects of the old Christian values from our ideology by secularizing them. Under this light, what Zarathustra had said earlier makes more sense now. When he criticized people for going back to animals rather than overcoming humans, in a sense he was talking about the old values. If you want progress, you should say goodbye to the old Christian values and stop returning to them. Now that we have talked about the death of God, we should move on. Once the soul gazed contemptuously at the body. This is a reference to Christianity as well as to Platonism. The reference to Christianity and asceticism is clear. If you want to know more about this, you should read on the genealogy of morality. For now, I want to tell you about what might be less obvious. What does the passage have to do with Platonism? In Plato's Apology, Socrates shows no fear of death. He actually believes that the body prevents us from gaining knowledge. It prevents us from gaining higher reasoning. Therefore, he welcomes death as a way of escaping the body. So we could say that Socrates was not faithful to the earth. He had extraterrestrial hopes. Moving on. Truly, mankind is a polluted stream. One has to be a sea to take in a polluted stream without becoming unclean. Here we see another advantage of abundance. It makes you resilient. Zarathustra speaks on, Behold, I teach you the overman. He is this sea. In him your great contempt can go under. We've talked about going under earlier. Provided that you are in an exalted position, if your contempt goes under, it can also go over. Untergehen implies übergehen. What is the greatest thing that you can experience? It is the hour of your great contempt. Contempt. How can contempt be ever great? Of course, contempt is not a good thing in itself, but it can be used positively. Just a minute ago, we were talking about how contempt can go over by going under. So if you utilize your contempt positively, it can have positive effects. At what should you direct your contempt? at your happiness, reason, and virtue. In section 5, we will see why this is important. One of the things contempt can do for you is that it enables you to look at your actions objectively. And by looking at your actions objectively, you'll be able to criticize them. That's one aspect of contempt. I also wanted to tell you about reason and virtue, but it's already taken too long. We will encounter these concepts later in the book. We can talk about them then. So let's skip to the end and conclude this section. When Zarathustra had spoken thus, someone from the crowd cried out, We have heard enough already about the tightrope walker. Now let us see him too. And all the people laughed at Zarathustra. This is what happens when the individual and society clash. People think Zarathustra is a barker who is just introducing the tightrope walker. The ironic bit is what follows. But the tightrope walker, believing that these words concerned him, got down to his work. Why is this ironic? 
because even the only one who shows appreciation for Zarathustra's speech sort of belongs to the crowd. Just like everyone else, he presumes Zarathustra is a barker who is introduced in the tightrope walker. True, he applies what he hears to himself, but only because he happens to be the tightrope walker. He might accept what Zarathustra has to say, but he does so passively. Section 4 of the Prologue Mankind is a rope fastened between animal and overman. Besides the metaphorical imagery, this can be viewed as an importance to the storyline, because the tightrope walker is the only one who doesn't take Zarathustra's words lightly. Therefore, by hearing this, he has more reasons to believe that Zarathustra is talking about him. Zarathustra goes on, A dangerous crossing, a dangerous on the way, a dangerous looking back, a dangerous shuddering and standing still. Nietzsche believed in living dangerously. In this instance, the danger consists of looking back. We should be willing to take the risk. Remember what we said when we talked about God's death. God might be dead, but the old Christian values are well preserved. Looking back means looking at the old values. What is great about human beings is that they are a bridge and not a purpose. This can be viewed as a criticism of anthropocentrism. Human beings are not the ultimate goal of evolution. What might be perceived as problematic is that some might argue Nietzsche believed the overman to be the purpose and the goal. In an evolutionary sense, of course, this is clearly a false belief, because there is no purpose in evolution. This all depends how you decide to interpret the word overman. What is lovable about human beings is that they are a crossing over and a going under. I think we've already talked enough about these two verbs. The only thing that can be of interest to us is that in the original German, crossing over and going under are used in the noun form. Prior to this, they were used in the verb form. This subtlety is lost in English. Anyway, let's read on. I love the great despisers. Of course, Zarathustra is not talking about people who are full of hatred and despise everything in general. We need to keep in mind that Zarathustra is talking about a specific type of despisers. It's related to what we already discussed in the previous section. Contempt can be utilized in a positive manner to initiate a person's going under. He says, I love those who do not first seek behind the stars for a reason to go under and be a sacrifice, who instead sacrifice themselves for the earth, so that the earth may one day become the overman's. This passage makes sense under the light of what we discussed in the previous section about remaining faithful to the earth and leaving something behind for your posterity. Forget extraterrestrial hopes and concentrate on what you have here on earth. And should you decide to leave something behind, it should be something that is of this earth. Also pay attention to the word one day. It emphasizes that this is what you should do for generations to come. Your happiness alone is not what matters. It's not about today, it's about tomorrow. I love the one who lives in order to know and who wants to know so that one day the overman may live. This tells us that knowledge should be purposeful. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge is meaningless. I love the one who is ashamed when the dice fall to his fortune and who then asks, Am I a cheater? Nietzsche often talked about fate and fortune. What Nietzsche tries to tell us throughout his philosophy is that we should love our fate as it is. 
regardless of everything, we should accept our fate and love it. Being after too much fortune might mean that we are not accepting our fate as it is. I love the one whose soul is overfull so that he forgets himself. In the first section we talked about abundance, so we don't need to go through it again. Here I want you to pay attention to the act of forgetting. Nietzsche believed that forgetting is something that should be done actively. This is contrary to the common belief that we always forget passively. Passive forgetting is not Nietzschean. It takes effort to actively forget. At the end of the section, we are told what a society of individuals can achieve. I love all those who are like heavy drops falling individually from the dark cloud that hangs over humanity. They herald the coming of the lightning, and as heralds, they perish. The emphasis on individuality is obvious. But less obvious is the contrast between the single individual and the society of individuals. Nietzsche talks about individuality and solitude, but he doesn't mean that each person should just go sit in a corner and be alone with their thoughts as long as they're alive. Instead, pay attention to the pronoun they. It suggests that, together, these individuals can achieve something that goes beyond each of them. Behold, I am a herald of the lightning and a heavy drop from the cloud, but this lightning is called Overman. Zarathustra doesn't completely disassociate himself from everyone else. He refers to himself as a drop falling from the same cloud from which every other drop falls. However, the adjective heavy indicates that he distinguishes himself from others. Not every drop is as heavy as Zarathustra. He considers himself to be an individual just like everyone else, but his exaltation distinguishes him from other drops, hence his heaviness. Not everyone is equal in their level of individuality. Not every drop is equal, some are heavier than others, and there should be no shame in acknowledging that. Section 5 of the Prologue When Zarathustra looks at people, he sees that they laugh. This laughter causes him pain. But we need to be careful how to interpret this. Zarathustra was a great believer in laughter. If you read the book until the end, you will see there are moments of self-mockery involved in the actions of Zarathustra. Self-mockery requires higher intelligence, because it is the result of grasping irony and being able to look at your actions from a distance. However, the laughter that is coming from the crowd comes from stupidity. It has a different nature. After receiving the reaction he was not expecting, Zarathustra decides to talk about the most contemptible person. He naively assumes this should scare the crowd. The obnoxious being about whom Zarathustra is about to tell us is called the last human being. Zarathustra urges people to take action. It is time that mankind set themselves a goal. It is time that mankind plant the seed of their highest hope. Mankind needs a goal or a purpose in life. Otherwise, his existence will be meaningless. In section 3, we talked about extraterrestrial hopes. Here we see Zarathustra telling people to plant the seed of their highest hopes. So he is not against having hopes in general. He is just against extraterrestrial hopes. So long as your hopes and goals are faithful to the earth, you are welcome to have them. He urges people to take action because the time of the most contemptible human being is coming. The one who can no longer have contempt for himself. Why is it so important to have contempt? Why not having contempt can turn you into the last human being? Because 
without contempt you cannot become exalted. Contempt can help you criticize yourself and your actions. It helps you look at yourself from a distance. At the beginning of the section we mentioned irony. In contempt there is also irony and it is that irony which enables you to look at your actions objectively and critically. The saddest thing is that the last human beings believe that they have invented happiness. They prefer to live their little cozy lives and live without any great passions. The way Nietzsche describes the last human beings really sounds like he is describing a hippie commune of a sort. Who wants to rule anymore? Who wants to obey anymore? Both are too burdensome. Zarathustra is describing the lack of antagonism in society as a bad thing. We shall find out why in a bit. No shepherd and one herd. Each wants the same. Each is the same, and whoever feels differently goes voluntarily into the insane asylum. This can be used as a criticism for any exaggerated ideology, be it communism, be it Christianity, or what have you. In this commune, people still quarrel, but they reconcile quickly. Why should anyone be against quick reconciliation? for good reasons. It all has to do with progress. A society in which everyone agrees with one another becomes static. New ideas are born out of disagreement, argument and antagonism. Moreover, in this commune, one has one's little pleasure for the day and one's little pleasure for the night, but one honors health. Whenever I read this passage, I wonder if this does not describe our own society in the West today. People are too concerned with eating healthy and staying healthy in an exaggerated manner. Let's go back to the text. Unfortunately, when the crowd hears about the last human beings, they become excited and tell Zarathustra to make them into the last human beings. Zarathustra is once again disappointed and he expresses his disappointment by saying, They do not understand me. And he sees the problem. He says, Too long apparently I lived in the mountains. Too much I listened to brooks and trees. Now I speak to them as to goat herds. The final phrase is important because it tells us that Zarathustra is becoming what he had feared. He is becoming a shepherd. A few pages later he will regret this. Also, I want you to compare the last human beings with someone like Zarathustra. The difference is that the last human beings cannot look at themselves objectively. Otherwise, they would realize how contemptible they are. However, Zarathustra is able to look at himself critically. Just as the section started with laughter, it also ends with mentioning the laughing crowd. And now they look at me and laugh. And in laughing, they hate me too. There is ice in their laughter. Once again, this laughter does not come from a sense of irony. Rather, it comes from the stupidity of the crowd, 